Let's get into how uh, virtual memory systems implement all these nice features uh, for our processes. Um, let's uh, review the problems that uh, virtual memory is trying to address. First problem is we have to fit a huge memory uh, address space into a tiny physical memory. Uh, again, uh, physical memory does not have 16 exabytes of space. Uh, typically, it's just a few gigabytes. So how do we think about that? Uh, then, how do we manage the memory spaces for multiple processes, make the problem even harder? Now it's not just 16 exabytes, but it's 16 exabytes for each process. Uh, and then, how do we protect processes from uh, stepping on each other's, uh, uh, each other's memory? At the same time, we want to allow processes to share common parts of memory uh, so that we can be more efficient with this little physical memory that we do have. So how would you go about solving these problems? Uh, it turns out there's one, uh, there's one important technique that comes up over and over again in computer science that can help us with all of these. And that technique is called indirection. The quote you see at the top of this slide, uh, any problem in computer science can be solved by adding another level of indirection, is a common thing you'll hear people say, sometimes jokingly, but really seriously, um, uh, that Almost anything can be uh, addressed by this particular technique. And it's an important technique for referring to objects uh, in, uh, in memory in, uh, and how to point to them. Uh, let's take a look at what we mean by uh, pointing to an object. So if I have a name for something, like let's say I've, I've stored a pointer in a variable, uh, a, a pointer type, I can have it point to something in memory, okay? And without indirection, uh, I have a direct link in that, namely, uh, this variable stores a particular address that points directly to that memory location. Uh, that works great until uh, I decide that I want to move this thing in memory and put it somewhere else. And if I want to do that, I have a problem in that I have to go find every single variable that might have pointed to that object and change the address uh, stored at that variable. Well, that can be uh, very burdensome and hard to keep track of. So what indirection does is it says, you know what? Instead of having a direct link between the two, let's add something in the middle that will serve kind of as a directory, uh, some, uh, a lookup table, if you will, so that when I have a particular uh, pointer to an object, I won't have a direct pointer to it. I'll have an indirect pointer to it that namely uh, goes into this directory and says, you know, the third thing I was referring to. So that now uh, I will look it up in that directory in the third slot, for example, and find the address of the thing. Now that involves an extra step. I have to first go to this place in memory, find the directory, look up the third element of the directory, and then I'll get the address in memory that I, I'm, I really want. So it's a little bit of extra cost because I have to do that second memory access. However, if I change the position of the thing or I just want to point to something else uh, using that same original variable name, well, then that's really easy to do because all I have to do is change the directory uh, to, point, uh, to point here uh, now and not have to worry about what variables uh, might I have to go back and change. Anything that referred to the third slot in that memory, is on our, as in our example, can now just point to that because I'll find a new address in that third slot in my lookup table in my directory. All right, so this is how indirection works. And uh, there's lots and lots of examples of this uh, that rely on this ability to have a flexible mapping between a variable or, uh, that stores a pointer and the actual object in memory so that I can easily switch between what things I'm pointing to. Um, and examples of these include things like the domain name service that helps you find the actual machines that host your websites on the web, uh, the phone system, uh, things that allow cell phone portability, or find your cell phone depending on which cell tower you happen to be near, uh, mail forwarding uh, at the post office uh, is an example of indirection. Um, lots and lots of things uh, that we use in our daily lives 
uh, rely on this uh, ability to go and look up things in a directory and then as a second step find the actual uh, thing of interest rather than having a direct name for it in the first place. And this is going to be fundamental uh, to how we build virtual memory. Uh, namely, we're going to add a level of indirection uh, to our address uh, mapping to physical memory. So our processes uh, here are going to be generating uh, virtual memory addresses and we're going to put a big directory in the middle uh, to take that virtual memory address and turn it into a physical memory address to find the spot in physical memory where we've actually put that thing. This is how we're going to give each process the illusion of having their own physical memory, uh, even though they're, they are not aware of each other and they're generating potentially the same address uh, internally to a process. Uh, but it's going to potentially be mapped to a different place in physical memory. And this is going to be useful to solve all of those problems uh, that we had. So let's uh, go a little bit more into detail on this. So uh, let's remind ourselves about the address spaces that we have. Our virtual address space, what our processes generate as addresses, is uh, 2 to the n, where n is the number of bits in our address. In our case of our 64-bit machines, that's 2 to the 64. Our, our physical address space is 2 to the m, typically where m is much, much smaller than n. So we might have a physical address space that is only uh, really 34 bits or 38 bits, but not 64. Uh, 64 would be uh, just a huge address space uh, to implement in physical memory. All right. Now, our mapping, since uh, we have all of these virtual addresses uh, in our process, is we can only fit some of them in the actual physical memory, which again is much smaller. The rest will have to be stored on disk. In other words, rather than having those values uh, be in physical memory, we're going to put them on a slower but much larger storage device, namely a hard drive, or these days a uh, an SD, an SD card or a, uh, a solid state drive. But it's not going to be in our fast physical, faster physical memory. It's going to be on a slower device uh, out on a disk. All right, so what we'll want to do is as we uh, execute our program, we may need a memory that is stored on disk. At that point, we'll want to get it and bring it into physical memory so we can access it there. And we'll see the details of that in a little bit. So let's just uh, remind ourselves, if we were just using physical addressing, what we would have is our CPU would generate a physical address. It would go directly to main memory, find the location in the main memory where uh, that address is, and get the value there and bring it uh, back into the CPU. Right? In this case, reading four bytes out of the memory. This is the standard approach for very simple computer systems like embedded microcontrollers, uh, things you might find in an elevator or a microwave oven, uh, things like that, um, where it is well known in advance how much memory we'll actually need. It's a single uh, or a few function device. Uh, it's not going to get new apps loaded into it. Uh, so we don't have to worry about uh, allocating that memory in, uh, in very uh, flexible ways because we won't have a lot of different processes running. In fact, for the most part in these uh, small embedded systems, we'll have a single process and it can have uh, full use of that physical memory directly using a physical address. However, in uh, larger systems, uh, things like our desktops, our laptops, even our cell phones uh, these days, um, and certainly servers, we will have a CPU not generate a direct physical address, but a virtual address uh, that will then go through a mapping function here labeled an MMU, or Memory Management Unit, that will keep track of where those pieces of memory are. Are they in physical memory? Are they on disk? Uh, and we have to bring them into the physical memory before we can access them. All those sorts of things will be done inside of this uh, 
memory management unit, which will then generate a physical address that will be used to actually access the physical memory. And again, just get that data and bring it around back into the CPU as before. But that mapping function in between is that level of indirection. And that is uh, one of those great ideas in computer science that is uh, used to solve many, many problems. And uh, in the next few videos, we'll go into the details of how this is implemented uh, for virtual memory.